Well, I buy my animals by the animal. There you go. Yeah. Like, Half a steer and a whole pig. There I've you been go. Doing it year. That's what yeah. we like to do, too. So we're live now. Hey, everybody. I am here with Sally K. Norton, one of the foremost, or I would say the foremost expert on oxalates that you will find. Um, Sally K. Norton earned her Bachelor of Science degree in nutrition from Cornell. She got a master's degree in public health leadership from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And she's been educating people about health, wellness, holistic healing for about three decades now. And as far as oxalates, I don't think there's anybody out there who knows more than Sally K. Norton who's talked to more people about their own personal experiences with oxalates. And I am honored to share this information with you um, Sally K. Norton is going to go deep into some of the most uh, alarming plant toxins out there that a lot of us have no idea we've been consuming in such large amounts for such a long time. So Sally Norton, thank you so much for coming on. How's it going today? Great. Good to meet you and your audience. It's fun. Nice. Nice. So how... Yeah. Hi, <laughs> hey guys, we got a bunch of people in the chat right now. Uh, people will pop in later on as they get notified. Hopefully YouTube is nice and notifies you today. But um, we're, we're so excited to talk about this. So how did you, I guess we'll start from the beginning. Like how the heck did you get involved in researching and going deep into oxalates? Well, it was a kind of a long process of finally discovering that I was sick from oxalate. And then it kept unfolding how intensely oxalate was affecting my health. It turns out from probably all the way back when I was 12, I'm now 55 years old. And uh, I was really, my mind was being blown. It was 2013 and all kinds of layers of my health puzzle started peeling off with changing my diet truly to low oxalate. I had tried it in 2009 and become oxalate aware in 2009, thanks to an organization called the Volva Pain Foundation because I had an intense attack attack of crotch pain that was driving me crazy so much that I I like threatened to rip off my own genitals and my husband got on the internet and found the Volva Pain Foundation and they really deserve credit. They're really the modern innovator that's Joanne Yant who founded that organization so that she could educate people about pelvic pain and the connection with oxalate and she's been committed to getting foods tested for 25 years, which the nutrition field has not done, the um, medical field has not done, the toxicology fields have not done that. It's been one lady with crotch pain who has brought this to the fore, and then another woman who's a brilliant researcher who also did work with a different group of pain um, subjects that were centered around autistic children. And these families with autistic kids followed in the footsteps of the, the pain project that was part of the, the seed for the Volva Pain Foundation. And they found amazing results. And Susan Owens, who is uh, very smart with physiology and sulfur metabolism, recognized that we're accumulating oxalate at a rate and uh, is a commonality that's unrecognized. And the process of getting it out of your body is not quick. And so when you start when you start stopping the overdose of oxalate that we do with our conventional diets, you are beginning a journey of getting rid of oxalate. You're not yet solved the problem. You've just found out what the problem is, and now you need to address it for a long time to come so your body clean it up. And so Susan was uh, has been leading groups a group on the internet for years. And and so, but my introduction to it was that vulva pain. And in 2013, I was trying to solve a lot of health problems and realized, I finally got this connection because now for, for years, I had some awareness when I was eating oxalate and when I wasn't because I had learned it all in 2000 or learned enough. There's no such thing as learning it all. <laughs> but I learned enough to realize that what I was doing was adding in some oxalates and I thought it was not a big deal because I didn't have any crotch pain and I didn't know that there was more to it than that. And then my arthritis started coming back. Hmm. And... I got stiffer and stiffer and I, I couldn't work a yoga pose. And I was like turning old, like in fast time over the course of a couple of months of eating kiwis every day, I saw myself turning old, like a decade every month. I was getting stiffer and more arthritic and more frail feeling. 
And it finally dawned on me that my lifelong problems with joint pain, muscle pain, and arthritis, especially the arthritis part, was connected to oxalate. And I was like, whoa, I thought oxalate was vulva pain. Hmm. And then it, it goes on from there. Well, that's so interesting. It's not something that's very common. I mean, you don't really hear people connecting vulva pain with possible toxicity from the diet, right? I mean, it's not something that uh, right. that a lot of us would be familiar with. Um, how So... You removed oxalate from the diet, and it got worse. Well, I felt pretty good for about three weeks. <laughs> and then mm. I got intense facial pain. It was like what I call a facial migraine for three weeks. And it was incredible. I was having trouble falling asleep, and it was driving me crazy. I was like, oh, my God, I don't know how long I can go on like this. And then it stopped. And ever since, I've no longer got sinus pain or sinus infections. And prior to that, I had got a sinus infection every year, right around New Year's Eve, every mm. year since I was 17 years old. Wow. Yeah, so, I mean, I grew up with asthma, allergies, chronic inflammation, like joint pain at a very young age. My grandmother had pretty intense osteoarthritis, um, or rheumatoid arthritis. And, um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is it actually really hits cro close to home when I started looking at these plant toxins. So what, uh, what exactly are oxalates? What the heck are they doing? And what do they have to do with joint pain, possible vulva pain, uh, you know, skin disorders and stuff like that? A lot of people here who are listening might have no idea what oxalates are. Right. Um, well, oxalate, we often talk about them in the plural, or we say oxalate, meaning them in plural as well, because it's, it starts off as an acid, oxalic acid, which is a little tiny two-carbon molecule with four oxygens and two protons or hydrogen molecules. Be being an acid, it's highly reactive. It drops those protein protons, which are positive charges, and ends up being electrically charged, ne negatively charged. They call that anion. And that quickly bonds with other positive charges, with positive charges like calcium, magnesium, all kinds of minerals, and things aren't even minerals. So they, they tend to be, um, e oxalate comes as either an acid, an ion, or a crystal. Because when it grabs, or a, a calcium molecule or a magnesium molecule grabs the oxalic acid and vice versa, they are now a salt. So we say oxalate now instead of oxalic acid. Oxalate is referring to that salt form, and that can form with a heavy metal or a soluble form, which is potassium oxalate and sodium oxalate. Those are the ones that will change partners easily. The ones that don't change partners are calcium and magnesium bond much more strongly, especially calcium. And once you get that bond, you've basically stolen calcium for good. Mm -hmm. So the, the soluble oxalate and the oxalate ion very quickly will grab a calcium. If you're absorbing potassium or sodium oxalate from your diet, it's grabbing calcium from either your food or your bloodstream. And of course, there's lots of ions, so you, there's room to do both. And so we eat a lot of soluble oxalate. We also eat the salt forms, which turn into nanocrystals, and they grow even bigger into these microcrystals. And some of the oxalates in the food we're eating are giant or microcrystals that are so big you can't absorb them at all. Mm -hmm. So that's the calcium oxalate that's insoluble that you don't absorb. But that stuff is like little shreds of glass. It forms these really interesting but pretty scary looking daggers that are like toothpicks with points on each end and these round clusters that have these plates that are very sharp. They're like, they almost look like a... a, a ammunition in war because mm -hmm. they're so sharp and pointy yeah they do they look like weapons and i used <laughs> some uh, an image of oxalates and it's got several different types of formed crystals in the cover image for this video and they're frightening i mean they, these do not look like things that you'd want to consume i mean i, mean, I guess some of them almost look like salt crystals but yeah yeah it's it's definitely not uh they, they don't look very attractive as far as like uh mouthfeel goes yeah, yeah. And, you know, some people will remember that sometimes spinach will give you a gritty feeling in your mouth. Mm. And people sometimes think it's the sand and the spinach, but it might just be the oxalate crystals forming in your mouth. What we've got here is there's this type of spinach, like the local spinach that everybody grows. Um, I'm not sure the name of it internationally. They just call it espinaca. Um, but this stuff will burn your throat. Like it actually, it, it feels so 
powerful. And if you don't steam it a lot and then strain out the water, it'll make your throat numb. Um, I remember trying to eat a little bit raw with a salad before, and it just, I, I felt like I was going to vomit. It, my, my throat got swollen. Um, and they said, no, you always cook this stuff. You always got to cook it. Um, so it wasn't like the same spinach you're seeing in the U.S. The baby spinach is so popular. Um, and baby but, spinach is plenty bad. And, mm. and there are plants that are so high in oxalate that you can tell they're pure poison. Like the leaves on a rhubarb plant will, it can kill you. They're so high in oxalate. Wow. And the tropical plants, you probably have them where you live, that live in the forest floor are very high in oxalate. Dumb cane is used as a house plant or a mall plant here mm -hmm. in the U.S. And that's got that same... Um, high levels of soluble and those crystals, the ones that are pointed like arrows, the double ended arrows, those are called rapides. Yeah. And they literally do, it's called dumb cane because it paralyzes your voice box and the immune system reaction causes a complete wreck of the mucosal membranes in the back of the mouth, the tongue, the throat. And you literally could be made un unintelligible for days, four to five days after just a drop of sap could disable your voice back. So that's why they call that it. That plant is here. There's this red, this red leafed bush tree that they use because it's really rapidly growing and we use it as living fences. But it has this white sap that if you break one of the stems off of it, uh, everybody around knows you never put that stuff on your skin. You never want to put it in your mouth and you keep children away from it. Um, and it's everywhere. It's all over. That's oxalate. Wow. Wow. And that's one of the most powerful poisons around here. If you were to take a few drops of that, it could be used as like an assassination weapon or something. And uh, and I know that actually I, I've heard of oxalate being used in the past as such. And I think it was from you that I that I received that information, right? Has, yeah. has, has oxalate actually been weaponized at times in history? Well, the, one, the easy way to weaponize it is to use a precursor molecule. Mm. You can use dry cleaning fluid, but that's noxious and a person would know you're poisoning them. Mm. But antifreeze, a pro ethylene glycol, is turned to oxalate in the body. And so that is sweet tasting. You could slip a little into the coffee of your lover oh. every day and in a couple of weeks they're gone. And then you could just blame the spinach smoothies when the coroner asks about it. <laughs> you know, oh, that's like, crazy. That's yeah, so, it's really so alarming. Yeah, you kill someone with oxalate. It is a lethal toxin. Don't try this at home, guys. You got some Don't weirdos, try in, you got some weirdos in the chat, I'm sure. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're not recommending it, but that's why the very first experimental toxicology study that was really done well and taken seriously was because the very first person assigned to this new role of medical jurisprudence um, was seeing these reports in the news in the early 1800s, this is about 1814, mm -hmm. of people taking what they thought was Epsom salts, it looks just like Epsom salts, but it was actually oxalic acid. It was called salts of sorrel or salts of um, wow. lemon. I and used they, to eat sorrel. I used to love the taste of it. You know? Sorrel Salads. is worse than spinach. Oh. Yeah, your sorrel, you're halfway to your 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 version of spinach, it's really quite toxic and has mm -hmm. did kill a guy who ate several bowls of sorrel soup and he died a few hours later in the emergency room from oxalate poisoning from oh, the soup. Goodness. I've seen that study. Yeah, and that's, yeah. Uh, there's... The Lancet. Mm -hmm. It was a brief report in the Lancet from the 80s, I think, 1984 maybe. Well, why are we looking at spinach as a health food? Why is it being recommended as a great source of vitamins and minerals if, you know, I mean, you, you mentioned... Uh, the blocking of certain of ele uh, certain electrolytes too. It seems like it's got an affinity for calcium, potassium, magnesium. So many of us having uh, magnesium and potassium deficiencies in the general population, um, and then we're eating all this oxalate. We're eating all this spinach, thinking it's going to help us. Quite the opposite. The high oxalate foods and oxalate in your body is draining your body of minerals in a way that's more profound than I ever imagined possible. But I see it in clients. I had someone in the emergency room a couple of weeks ago with a complete T wave, inver T wave inversion because she was so depleted in potassium. And this was just after she went from a keto diet high in almond flour. She's doing almond bread daily mm -hmm. and went carnivore in a sudden shift and it set her in the hospital wow. about a week after going carnivore. She was practically dying. Um, and it's been a hard couple of weeks to come back from that because she's so depleted in potassium and minerals. Wow. So yeah, spinach, I mean, we knew in the 1930s that spinach wasn't delivering these minerals, especially iron and calcium. We knew absolutely that there was no value 
from spinach for calcium or iron. Yeah. And that, you know, it wasn't a safe food, especially for pregnant women and children. We've already known that. It's just... This is a matter of amnesia. Like we've known about how toxic this stuff is for hundreds of years, but then we discovered we're so smart because we discovered phytonutrients and phytonutrients are somehow going to save us. We'll just measure phytonutrients and just look at that one little potential benefit that's theoretical and forget the actual downsides that are known and not theoretical at all. So we choose our theory that plant chemicals are good and ignore the bad side of plants completely. Mm-hmm. Scary. So you've kind of come to see plants in a different light in the last few decades, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I yeah, mean, I, I, I know that myself and a lot of people I got in. I love them and respect them, but yeah. that doesn't mean you should eat them. So did you go through a period where you were going for, towards more of a plant-based diet? I know when a lot of us try to get our health in line, that's the first information that resonates with most. We've been told saturated fat's bad. We've been told animal fats are naughty, that we should stay away from them, that we're going to get a heart attack if we eat a lot of them. And so we kind of almost naturally gravitate towards the ideas around plants being medicinal as a, uh, you know, as a food source. Did you do that as well? I mean, I know I well, went through my phase. just that whole idea, um, medicinal as a food source, think about that sentence. Mm -hmm. Should you be eating medicine as food? <laughs> so if something's medicinal, does it equal food? And this idea is food is medicine, it can be taken to the complete wrong direction. Mm -hmm. All right. So, amen, we use plants as medicine. Like, often the main use of plants as medicine historically was to get you to vomit. Like the point of plant was to expel stuff, to give you diarrhea and vomiting, to clean out a problem, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily to make you awesome. Yeah, right. I don't think I don't think medicinal plants were ever about becoming the alpha male in the tribe or anything. It wasn't mm -hmm. ever used like that. But now we eat plants as if we're going to be the alpha gale in the gym. That's funny. And that's not how, right? Isn't that funny? Yeah. And then well, and then our health starts to fail. And then we think, well, maybe I'm detoxifying from all my previous meat eating. You know, that's kind of, kind of the, the standard yeah. dialogue among the vegan crowd is, well, you're just still addicted to the meat. You're still addicted to these foods. But perhaps we're looking at a little bit, uh, perhaps we're looking at issues with the digestibility and the assimilability of the nutrients in these plants. So what are, can, do you want to go ahead and, um, we kind of touched on this briefly, but what are some of the issues with absorption that can be brought about from the high intake of oxalate? You know, when you eat spinach, people think that it's got calcium in it. We're going to eat spinach yeah. and get our calcium levels up. The RDA of calcium being set at a certain level. And if you eat this much spinach, you'll get that. Is, is there something else yeah. going on here that might be interfering? You see that also with um, people recommending high potassium foods. They're all high in maybe potassium oxalate, which is the worst form of oxalate because you're going to digest you're going to absorb that and you're going to chelate your calcium and your magnesium. If you're eating potassium oxalate, you're not only not going to get that potassium, you're also not going to get the calcium and magnesium that might be without food. Or worse still, you might lose those minerals from your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is a big problem in terms of mineral mayhem. The um, And I don't even think we fully appreciate at a scientific level the degree of problems that oxalate can cause with our mineral metabolism it also even if it's you're not eating the stuff that gets absorbed maybe you're just eating the ground grass you know the ground glass like crystals mm -hmm. that's physical stress on your digestive tract and is contributing to the gut problems which we now all have i don't think in today's world that eating plant toxins which seem to all be directed at gut problems are a good idea at all it seems like you couldn't find someone with a healthy gut lining anymore between the dysbiosis, thanks to antibiotics, and the junk food and the carbohydrates and things we've done, the emulsifiers and additives. The the whole ecosystem of the gut is destroyed, and the mucous membranes and the you know the whole cell tight junction and so on, and the, the mucus layer and things that should be there are just not able to handle these toxins the way we may have in the days when before all of these problems when we'd happen upon a blackberry patch or decide that we had to use spinach because the fish weren't running this week or something but uh, eating plants consistently day in and day out has never been done in human history until basically we invented highways and refrigerators mm -hmm. right now we would have always gone through at least period of the year where very little plants are available at all um, 
So, all right, so oxalates, we talked about the problem. We talked about what they actually are. Um, well, what foods are very high in oxalate and what foods might somebody want to avoid if they believe that they've had an oxalate problem or if this information resonates with them and they uh, you know, come to realize that perhaps these things should be avoided by most, if not all people, in the diet? What foods should we avoid? Okay, so foods that could get you in trouble that are really not your friends, but they have really great reputation. Obviously, we've talked about spinach. Almonds are having a heyday right now all over the globe. They're horrible. Uh, very high bioavailability of oxalate, full of mm. other toxins as well. Um, phytates and indigestible, as are all the nuts are very high in oxalate, as are seeds. And then there's legumes like peanuts are very high bioavailability. And a lot of the beans like black beans and the kind of navy beans and great northern beans, the basic bean of the like Boston baked bean, the American beans are really high in oxalate. Yeah. And so you'll notice that seeds, nuts, and beans, and whole grains, like the whole grains are also high. Those are all seed elements from plants. It seems that seeds require um, some calcium for later on use during germination. And the way it pantries or stores that calcium is with oxalic acid. So most seeds have oxalic acid, calcium oxalate in them. So if it's hmm. a seed, it, there's a good chance that it's got oxalate. And the nutrition facts are putting these as, <clears throat> as if it has... Calcium that's bioavailable for humans and dietary calcium, right? But it's not well, the case. Well, you're assuming that. As the user of the nutrition table, you're assuming that's calcium that's available for your physiology. That's not what the lab measured. The lab didn't bring you in to the lab and measured what calcium you got out of that food. They just burned it on a Bunsen burner, you know, dehydrated it, and it analyzed a food sample, which has nothing to do with biology. Mm-hmm. And then they stick it in the chart. And those of us in the field of nutrition and dietetics are putting together meal plans for sick people to reaching the RDAs of all the nutrients based on a basic Bunsen burner approach to nutrition rather than a biological approach to nutrition that would mm. factor in bioavailability. Yeah. Yeah. And then also Still, we're making assumptions. It's almost 2020. Mm-hmm. Primitive. That's pretty crazy. No, with also there's assumptions about the RDAs as well. You know, I mean, uh, we we all assume that these RDAs apply to everybody, and this is exactly, um, you know, the, the the correct amount to keep us from not getting deficiencies. But would you, um, you know, a lot of people in the carnivore community have kind of criticized the RDAs. What do you think about the current RDAs and where we derive those from? Well, the RDAs, and as all of nutrition really came out of the discovery of nutrients themselves and the discovery of deficiency diseases like pellagra and beriberi and kawashaka and all that, and we really didn't move much past that in terms of understanding metabolic needs for nutrients. You know, they did some age adjustments. And essentially the old school way of coming up with an RDA was come up with a deficiency level, what you need to avoid deficiency, double that and add a standard deviation amount and then call that the RDA. So they consider it like two and a half times past what you need to not be deficient and not being deficient is all we need to know. And we really haven't understood our physiology and our nutritional needs in the context of the whole physiology of the being. And what we're seeing, you know, with these different diet experiments is that nutritional needs will vary based on what metabolism you have in terms of what fuels your body are being fueled on will change your metabolism enough to change which enzymes are being run, which vitamins you need and which minerals you need when and where. So there, there's a real dynamic nature, I think, to um, even measuring these things. And I, I think we've measured deficiency based on 1930 style eating in the West, mm -hmm. in the U.S. and in England and in Germany, and that doesn't reflect maybe humans in their native environment. Yeah, or humans that are healthy, right? I mean, that's especially post World War II. If some of these RDAs were derived after you know the massive push for the industrialization of the food supply, um, I mean, we we all know that in the British population since the Industrial Revolution has seen a massive decline in dental health and proper formation of the jaw. Uh, you know, the hips getting more narrow, birth getting more difficult. So I don't think looking at these populations you know, post-industrial is a really good idea for It's not a good health. idea. It's not because it's basically the cornmeal mush generation where mm. suddenly you could live on cornmeal mush and um, these refined grain commodity products because people were urbanizing in order to work in these factories. Yeah. And the rural poor were very poor and literally living on just really inadequate diets. So... 
the availability of fresh animal food products became much um, more difficult as people moved off the farms and moved to work for factories six days a week for 10 to 12 hour days. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned uh, lots of these seeds and nuts. And what about, you know, f greens? You, we talked about sorrel and spinach being pretty high in it. Uh, another thing people are talking about, the amazing superpowers of kale. Um, is, is kale high in oxalate? And I've seen conflicting information about it. There are many varieties of kale, and some of them are pretty low, like the dino kale is low. I think the purple kale is pretty low, but green curly kale is really high. It's all over the place. Mm. Um, and that dino kale group, tastes like rubber, so nobody wants to eat well, the crap anyways. Kale, uh, kale is a, the example of what we were talking about earlier, about we discovered phytonutrients and tried some way to index the supposed antioxidant effects, and kale won that test. So it was a certain multiple choice tests given to vegetables and kale won the prize. And so kale just sort of took over a whole street in Madison Avenue and became the darling of the decade. Mm. And it's remember that it's, kale is the new beef. Remember hearing that? How ridiculous does that sound? <laughs> wow. <laughs> they, they were saying there was kale is the new beef. This was like the, uh, the calling card for the, uh, the, the kale pushers. It's crazy. <laughs> but, you know, vegetables have been held up since, you know, the 60s, really, since kind of the hippie generation as really cool and countercultural and, you know, get away from the man by not eating his beef and, you know, go off and eat quinoa and kale and be cool. And so and it just got codified in the 70s as we were going through environmental crises in the 70s. There was a whole, you know gas crisis and all this and people were getting really worried about the planet in the 70s so it's like oh that seemed to fit too and then they were teaching us in 1975 and 6 that kale and cabbage would save you from cancer and the hot dogs would give you cancer you know so this message has been around for 60 years now 50 years and so that's a lot of generations of like being taught that plants are so great but um, it's really coming from cultural elements, not from scientific ones. Yeah, we talk about that a lot here. You know, there's a lot of big money interest in consolidating the food supply and controlling resources and basically using food as a method for, um, you know, social engineering, the cultural landscape and controlling cultures and, you know, even uh, controlling migration of people. So we see, you know, the Bill, Bill Gates Foundation saving the world by pushing GMOs all over the place and spraying Roundup all over Africa. And, you know, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. And this stuff gets sold to us, you know, just like the spinach gets sold to us, you know, via, um, you know, some, some very clever marketing. Same thing with these broader movements like the Green Revolution and, um, and the GMO Revolution. These are not exactly what they seem. Um, hey, remember, what's up with Popeye? I mean, why is he so jacked? I think some of the, some of the vegans are going to say Popeye was doing pretty well on the, <laughs> on the spinach. They were thinking that iron was in spinach and it was a nutritional iron for a while. And, and there was, because of the poverty and the inability to get enough meat in some people in certain populations, they... Somebody came up with Popeye as a way to encourage iron consumption, and that absolutely is not true. Do oxalates interfere with the absorption of iron as well? Yeah. Yeah. Any, anything that it can bind to, it can either interfere with the absorption of or interfere with the use of it in your body. In your body, it oxalate takes the place of the molecule that sits on the ferritin molecule that delivers iron to tissues. Wow. So when that delivery, it's like, the delivery truck has been hijacked, hijacked by a terrorist, the terrorist being the oxalate, which can't let go of the iron. So the terrorist has thrown away the keys to the back of the truck. And so when the truck arrives at the tissue, the grocery store, it can't release the cargo yeah. because the keys got thrown away because oxalate is binding that iron so tightly to the ferritin molecule that it doesn't get delivered to the tissue. This is crazy. That's crazy. So... So it binds up. It can't deliver it properly to the tissue, but in some cases, does it actually deposit oxalate into tissues? Because you mentioned, you know, in your specific case, you were getting really intense crotch pain. Some people um, have terrible acne when they're dealing with, uh, you know, seeming oxalate toxicity. Um, does it get actually stored throughout our tissues as well? Yeah, that's the big story. 
that's the number one thing everyone needs to understand, mm -hmm. that that is what's happening, that we are accumulating oxalate every time we eat it. We're usually eating it in an amount that overwhelms the kidneys in the short run. And you put these waves. See, the thing about meals is you're eating a bunch of stuff at one time. And now that you juice your spinach, you can down it in a hurry before you run out the door to work. And you just throw at least a gram or a thousand milligrams of oxalate in a spinach smoothie down your gullet, which is 10 times over what they think you're eating all day long. Those kind of spikes guarantee the setup of new deposits in the body. And you see, because you absorb it from your digestive tract and then it goes straight through your liver and it's traveling through your vascular system and it gets hooked on any cells that are inflamed, damaged, injured, struggling, or even rejuvenating because those cells, when they're healing and rejuvenating, they, they put out this sort of sticky matrix of glycoproteins, these sugars mm -hmm. that creates a... Um, kind of a, a mesh, you would say, where the new cells that get produced in the healing process can move around. It's this called migration. Mm -hmm. So that is extra sticky for a couple of reasons. One is those sugars, those, the oxalate gets stuck on those sugars in those healing tissues, and those healing cells are not healthy enough to generate enough glutathione to protect themselves, or the cell is actually dead it's just a cell fragment or a tissue, a membrane piece or a mitochondria, and those are sticky. And so, and those tissues can't get rid of the oxalate because they're dead, dying, or struggling. So you get where you're going to get those deposits in your body are places where you've already got infection, injury, inflammation. So if you used your fingertips all day because you practice concertos, mm -hmm. probably your fingertips are where you've got your oxalates. Wow. Wow. So, uh, you know, when people who've got you know, chronic skin conditions, it's, uh, their skin is always inflamed, then they're getting high oxalate diet on top of that to try and fix it, right? They're doing their, their kale spinach salads and, um, you know, their uh, Dr. Gregor's daily dozen. And they could be doing the exact opposite. They could be exacerbating the problem immensely. We see this all the time. Yeah. And you've been doing this for years. So you probably talk to a lot of victims of these, uh, these high oxalate marketed diets out there, huh? Well, you know, a lot of people think, you know, because it's oddly, you cannot tell that oxalate's driving you crazy. You cannot, if you could, then we'd already know this yeah. because we'd pick out on our sweet potatoes and then we go, oh, that made me so sick. I'm not eating that anymore. Well, I, I see just, some people do that after they go carnivore, then they eat some sweet potatoes and it's like a whole day of just taking a dump. <laughs> you know, they spend the whole day on the toilet. Yeah. Yep. And so when you finally get off of it, suddenly your body is sensitized. It's like unmasking. And you see this masking of a toxin problem where you can't, you can't tell the toxins causing the illness until after you unmask it. And you unmask a toxin problem by getting away from the toxin long enough. And then, then suddenly the connection between the symptoms becomes much more obvious. So once people learn about oxalate, try to get off it, and then they don't really believe it, and then they go back and forth on and off because they're still addicted to their potatoes, which is another really big common source of oxalate are potato chips, fries, mashed potatoes. So all types of potatoes, including sweet potatoes. What about yams? Those are also high. Yams and sweet potatoes are basically the same thing, very high. They're probably worse than white potatoes. I can't remember We've basically exactly. named all the – I mean, these are the most popular plant-based foods, right? I mean, what do they have left yeah. if you're a vegan and you're trying to Venus stay – Potatoes, chocolate, beans, whole grains. I mean, yeah. Right. And I, like, really, I love chocolate. Know, Chocolate's one of my favorite foods. But it's, you know, looking at the oxalate content of it really makes one think twice. Is this the best food to be consuming regularly? Right? We get told no. it's a superfood. These are all superfoods. But maybe these are not the greatest foods. What about coffee? This is, there's a lot of controversy about the coffee oxalate content. Yeah, and, and all the reliable testing that's been done over the last 30, 40 years has said uh, coffee's really low. There was some study done in Hungary or something that came up with numbers that were like 40 times higher, and they're the only ones that did that. And there, there must have been something wrong with the calibration of their equipment or something weird about that study. I haven't um, had any direct contact with anyone affiliated with the publication of that study or the work that was done behind that, but... I don't buy that study. I think that um, people do okay on coffee. I, I'm personally never eat coffee. I'm allergic to it. Yeah, it's... I'm not really into coffee. My wife likes coffee, though. <laughs> yeah, well, most of the humans on the planet are addicted to coffee. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we're a small bunch, those of us who don't touch coffee. But I, coffee's fine. And if coffee wasn't fine, I probably would have been shot by now. 
So is it, it's not just confirmation bias. You think it's uh, it's pretty low on oxalate, relatively yeah, safe. Yeah, I, I do think it's low on oxalate. Yeah, because yeah. so many people unmask themselves. Like you know, those carnivores suddenly they realize they can't eat sweet potatoes. Um, that's later on if you get off enough oxalate and then you're drinking a big day of coffee, you'd probably notice it mm. if you're willing to notice it. Now I had talked to somebody yesterday. She's she completely forgot about the chocolate thing, and she had a piece of chocolate cake at a end of semester celebration. Mm -hmm. And the whole weekend, she had trouble with sleeping and pain and all kinds of issues, and she never put it together. Like she had forgotten that co chocolate was high. She just ate the cake because that's what you always do, and it's part of her role in this. She's a faculty member, part of being with the students and celebrating the end of the term. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't until she started, we started talking in a session that she's like, oh God, I, I forgot that cake was high oxalate and I felt horrible the whole weekend. Mm. So she didn't even, even though she now knows, she still didn't put it together. So even when you know, um, it, it's, it's so unusual to go back and be able to say, oh, yesterday I ate chocolate cake, so today I can't you know, bend my elbow without pain or something. Yeah. And it, it's even worse than that, where people often start relying on almonds and spinach smoothies and peanut butter and toast and things they think are safe foods like oh you can't have dairy and you can't have eggs and you can't have this you can't have that and so they narrow their diet down to the worst foods yeah. and they're still not getting better and so that's a real tip right there if you're everything you're trying to do isn't really getting you any results that's because what you're doing isn't working mm -hmm. But we're so convinced that almonds are great or spinach is great. It, it must be that we're not doing it right. Mm -hmm. That's what and we're thinking. We're about. afraid of meats. We're afraid of animal foods. You know, we get told that the most easily digested foods are terrible for us, that they're terrible for the planet, and that they're bad. You know, I mean, it's, yeah, it's and it shocking. Yeah, and turn to putridness in your gut, and you just can't possibly digest meat. Putrefies, so, so we have, yes. We're so upside down and mm -hmm. so how does anyone stand a chance you know so it's right. very hard to tell when you're eating a high oxalate diet that it's screwing up your health yeah. and i couldn't tell for years i mean i even when i knew that oxalates could cause crotch pain i could not tell that the sweet potatoes were bothering me and i really didn't want to have to stay off the sweet potatoes i grow them you know i have the whole garden yeah. and so i even um considered going back to growing them again because i couldn't see the connection and do you know why you can't tell why can't you tell because once you stop eating them you're still full of oxalate and what happens you stop eating them you're still full of oxalates what does your body do it's got to deposit it, wants, it in scar tissues and the inflamed it tissues. It wants to expel it. It wants it out of there. Mm -hmm. It wants it out of there bad. And it'll literally push out whole crystals or it'll go after them metabolically and dissolve them and try to carry them out in the toxic nanocrystals, the toxic ion form that can be moved around in the blood, mm -hmm. which is very harsh and creates a lot of inflammation and a lot of symptoms and mayhem. So the cleanup process of getting it out of you creates these waves of feeling awful. And it'll interfere with your mental function, your mood, your ability to think straight, your strength in the gym, your aches and pains could come back. And uh, you get these mysterious flare-ups. And so you don't feel better when you stop your sweet potato because you're so toxic with oxalate that you already ate. Is there a cyclical nature to the flare-ups? I've heard you talk about this before. Yeah. It seems to be, but it seems really hard to predict. It obviously has something to do with the body's ability to garner the resources to do this hard work. Yep. So when it's got enough electrolytes, enough protein and calories, enough rest, enough something, um, that might be a situation to suddenly take advantage of, okay, now we can expel. But it, the most important trigger, I think, of the body trying to expel oxalates from tissues is having been low enough on the income side. So if you stop eating it and you're consistently low for a week or maybe it takes a year for some people, at some point the body's going to go, oh, cool, it's finally winter, I can expel these oxalates. Mm. So you're going to be feeling great for the first week on carnivore and then weird stuff is going to start happening and you won't know why. And it'll come and go. And how do we know that this isn't just, so to play devil's advocate here, how do we know that this is the oxalate dumping? How do we know something else isn't going on? Perhaps a deficiency in some of these plant compounds. Maybe we're not getting enough of the phytonutrients or the uh, 
Yeah. Um, you know, these, these other uh, fancy Enough things. Enough bacteria in the gut. I need more probiotics. Exactly. I need, we we I need, need more, more gut bacteria. I need to buy more supplements and I, I need to do this program over here yeah. and get enough fiber over here and got to have more bowel movements every day. And, you know, there's so many places to worry because there's so much products and ideas out there. It's just a mayhem mess. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You have to learn to watch your own body and learn some of the key signs. One of the key signs that not everybody gets is cloudy urine. Mm -hmm. And that is a lot of crystals in your urine causing the light to bounce off of it. So you want to watch the urine. Pee into a jar or a toilet bowl. Don't just pee in a compost pile or whatever. Look at your pee and see if it's cloudy. It'll often be cloudy after a bout of feeling kind of fatiguey or irritable or something else. Mm -hmm. There's things and like if you were to measure, could you measure the oxalate crystals in the urine if you were to have you know a, a microscope or certain lab equipment? I haven't done that. I don't have the lab equipment. I, it's a shortcoming of mine. I wish I had the space and time to do that. That would be fun. So um, I hope someone out there will start doing that. That would be interesting. You know, to, if someone were to do it some would. studies on this and look at the types oh of – Because if you could look at the oxalate crystal and actually – I'm sure through you know, some sort of uh, you know, spectroscopy uh, or whatever you call it, uh, you could actually see what it's binding to uh, if you were to you know, examine what we're experiencing. Well, not really, but you can see okay. the different shapes. And I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, on Instagram, I'll put up some pictures of crystals in urine, and you can see all the different shapes. There's dumbbell shapes. There's the double pyramid shapes. It makes all these different shapes, depending on the other macromolecules around, affects the growth of the crystals. Okay. So I'll put that up there, and you can see, if, theoretically, if we were looking at our cloudy urine, these are what you would see. So I'll, I'll put some pictures on Instagram. That'd be fun. Mm -hmm. um, but you can, in the meantime, you don't need heavy equipment. Most of us who are sick with oxalates can barely get through the day. And last thing we have time for is to look through a microscope because every useful moment we got to take care of our lives. A lot of us are quite sick and struggling with fatigue and aches and pains and problems they can't figure out, skin they can hardly live in. Yeah. Um, another sign while you're eating, before you go on a low oxalate diet, if you're eating a lot of almonds or something during the day, Often your symptoms are worse at night and you feel a little better in the morning. Mm. So difficulty sleeping perhaps could be associated with That's some oxalate That's classic. Diet. Almost everybody gets better sleep on the low oxalate diet. When I was um, struggling and trying that kiwi thing and finally figured out oxalate, my brain was waking up at night. I didn't even know it. I was so tired. I didn't know how badly I wasn't sleeping. But according to a sleep lab study, my brain was waking up 29 times every hour. Oh, wow. And that's the oxalate toxicity. The, the neurotoxicity is quite intense with the oxalates. And often those neurological symptoms go away fairly quickly. And so within like 10 days or less of being on the low oxalate diet, I was suddenly able to read again. I mean, it was, that lack of sleep meant I didn't have the mental energy to read my own mail. Wow. It's pretty bad. I couldn't work. I couldn't function yeah. at all. I couldn't exercise. So if you feel fatigued and like you're falling apart and you've got flare-ups of mysterious symptoms that come and go and travel around your body, that's a good pattern fit for this. So chronic yet, fatigue could be associated with oxalate toxicity. And fibromyalgia. Mm, which is rampant these days. Yeah. What about that's, mold toxicity? Because, I mean, this seems to be something that's almost synergistic or, you know, gives the same type symptoms. You know, I mean, we've, yeah. we've got a lot of mold in the house that we live in now. Most of the family is not too affected by it. We're moving soon, fortunately. But, uh, you know, it's, I've noticed that seasonally I'll definitely, you know, get more symptoms of, of the exposure, um, you know, during the rainy season like we're in now. So there's both the toxicity, which is often like when it's close at hand, like you're absolutely absorbing it or the mold's growing in your system. And then there's a sort of allergy mm. to the molds. So there's two different pieces to that. And allergies in general, sensitivities that are allergic in nature are very common with people who are sick with oxalate. The oxalate is a chronic immune system stimulator. So you've got the innate immune system being irritated perpetually by oxalates that are in your tissues and oxalates that you're eating and are flowing around through your system because they keep flushing in, your body keeps having to move them out. That chronic exposure to an immune system irritant promotes autoimmunity and allergy especially in the context of a fully immunized public who has an immune system that's unhappy, who has a dysregulated microbiome, 
there's a lot of problems with immune function these days, and oxalate is a major player that's adding to that immune dysregulation, our general deficiency in nutrients, and our toxic load. Oxalate's this huge elephant in the middle of this toxic world we're living in, and we're not even willing to look at that because it's a natural toxin. Mm -hmm. And it's just, we're constantly ingesting it. Constantly ingesting it, which is why it's so bad because, you know, it's constant. And so, yeah, too much oxalate in the system makes it more possible for molds to grow in your body mm -hmm. because you're changing the pH and the, the terrain of your tissues. And now if you do get a mold spore sucked into your lungs, it's more likely going to take up residence or the natural yeast that grow in your body like candida will flare up when oxalates are high because the the change in the local conditions there. Yeah. So it allows for dysbiosis of the vaginal tract and dysbiosis in the gut. It allows for infection because your system is so stressed with the oxalate toxicity. Mm -hmm. All right, so we talked about what oxalates are, what happens when they accumulate in the body. We started talking a little bit about the, uh, the detoxification of oxalates, how your body will kind of get rid of them. You use the term dumping, which uh, I think it's a good term. Um, what can we do to aid that process? Like, well, what can we do to actually help out when our body's dumping these oxalates? Because you mentioned people get symptoms. You know, they might get, um, well, while they're consuming a lot of oxalates, kidney stones are obviously an issue. But when we're passing them, um, when people are getting brain fog, if people are maybe getting some, uh, some symptoms of the uh, dumping of these oxalates, is there anything they can do to improve that? Is there anything they can do to, uh, to not exacerbate it at least? Right. So to not exasperate, I think is the most important thing. You don't want it to, you don't want to shock your system in any way, any kind of trauma, even just a trampoline, you know, the rebounder exercise where you're using G force mm. jumping around, that's enough shaking you up that can shake oxalates loose and make you quite sick. So if you've tried rebounding and it, you know, you don't tolerate it, bingo sign that you're probably oxalate. Um, if you're not, if you're in a really toxic state and still eating oxalates and you don't tolerate sauna, that might be a sign that the sauna is helping you move, which is a highly recommended therapy once you go low oxalate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I love saunas. Way, yeah, saunas is something that's helped me a lot. It. It's gentle, very gentle exercises, but vigorous exercise where you're putting stress on your joints or demanding too much. You might just trigger more pushing out of oxalates and you don't want too much at once because like you said the kidney stones a great example too much at once you're going to end up with a kidney stone you might end up in the hospital with kidney damage or completely lose a kidney if you have too much moving at once so you you want to hold back on this expulsion of the oxalates as much as you can and facilitate um, movement through the kidneys we like to use citrate lemons is a great form of citrates you can take like a third of a cup of lemon juice or half cup a day if you tolerate lemons, mm -hmm. but you can use citrate supplements, potassium citrate, magnesium citrate, calcium citrate. How much of those would you be, uh, what would the dosage of some of these be? You would start low with those and work your way up. And you um, adjust the calcium <clears throat> to your tolerance based on constipation and uh, factors like that. Mm -hmm. You can build up from like 200 milligrams to 1200 milligrams of calcium citrate without vitamin D. The main reason we like calcium citrate is because you can use it as a magnet in the colon to help draw oxalates out through the colon. The colon will excrete oxalate to help the kidneys when the kidneys are stressed mm -hmm. or you're so low in potassium that your system is acidotic. If you've got metabolic acidosis, the colon is going to start trying hard to get rid of the oxalate. The kidneys do less and less of that work. Yeah. So having calcium will help chelate and grab that oxalate and help you remove it through the feces. So yes. that's, we, people need to understand the point of the calcium is not so much to absorb it as it is to use it as a magnet to pull it out. So some people are worried about supplemental calcium because like you mentioned, vitamin D being important for calcium homeostasis and, you know, vitamin K2 uh, being important for the proper usage. Um, do you think there's a danger in supplement, supplemental, supplemental calcium? You know, I, I don't pretend to be an expert on that. I think it's the the research we have hasn't taken in a f account enough elements or facets of the problem yeah. that we're really know what we're talking about. Um, I think you're going to have to recognize that we do need some calcium to protect us from the oxalate problem. And the oxalate has made calcium a problem for your metabolism. And, um, it, you're going to have to judge for yourself. I mean, yeah. the Volvo pain foundation likes to encourage 
everyone to use at least 1,200 milligrams a day. And what was the foundation called again? Love, what was it? The, the vulva pain. Oh, vulva, okay, yeah. Vulva pain is in female genitals, vulva pain foundation, the VP foundation. She re- likes to recommend <sighs> that people move up to and stay with 1,200 milligrams of calcium and use more when the symptoms are up. And it does seem to help to add minerals when the symptoms come up, add more potassium, add more magnesium. Potassium is really critical. Potassium is being wasted like crazy on all this inflammation that we've got. And oxalate, when it's moving around, seems to allow a lot of potassium wasting. So potassium, citrate, you, know, you want to be taking at least half the RDA and work your way up to you know close to the RDA. And it's still not too much. If you have kidney stones they'll prescribe even 12 or 10 grams of potassium citrate. Yeah, they were using so, that on kids with uh, on ketogenic diets back in the day when they would put kids on ketogenic diet. One of the symptoms, one of the side effects for some reason was kidney stones. Uh, I'm not sure why that was, but this was the 1920s and 30s, so they give them potassium citrate to avoid the kidney stones. Yeah, it's still a standard treatment for kidney stones, potassium nice. citrate. So that, I think potassium citrate is so, so important. And magnesium citrate, take as much to bowel tolerance as you want. You can play with other forms of those minerals as long as you're getting some citrate forms. Um, But those are a big help. And, you know, just not traumatizing your body, not going low oxalate in an abrupt way. Mm -hmm. If you've been eating a lot of high oxalate foods, you need to come down slowly so that you don't trigger that feeling that the body, the body's looking for the moment when it can get rid of these toxins. It's been carefully holding on to them as you've been overeating them thinking this is a temporary situation. We'll just hold on to this until you get out of this blackberry patch kind of physiology. We're just temporarily protecting the heart. We're temporarily protecting the vascular system, temporarily protecting the kidneys while you're eating these wrong foods. And once you stop eating the wrong foods, the body's like, yay, okay, we're going to get rid of this now. And you don't want to trigger the expulsion impulse. You want to come back down, have the this flow of oxalates come down slowly enough that you don't suddenly trigger this big release of oxalate. You'll make yourself, it's like you're sicker with oxalates and have more oxalates that are affecting your tissue after you stop eating them than you were when you're eating them. It's weird. What is it about the citrate forms of these minerals that's better? You know, because a lot of people are supplementing with like uh, no salt, potassium chloride when they do low carb diets. Why is potassium citrate better yeah. in the case of oxalate? Citrate is um, a chemical that the body uses, and it's very helpful in kidney stone prote- protection because it lays down on these crystals and prevents them from growing. So it prevents new attachment. It prevents growth, so your kidney stone can't grow. And it also, as it's sitting on an oxalate deposit, it destabilizes the lattice that is basically the calciums in the calcium oxalate form this lattice work that makes a crystal, that there's an electromagnetic pull that the the, um, citrate's forming on that crystal that helps it to dissolve. So the effect is you're protecting your kidneys from kidney stones, you're protecting your tissues from attachment of oxalate to them, and you're protecting your tissues that do have oxalate from having the current deposits grow bigger. Mm -hmm. There you go. Great explanation. Yep. Okay. Um, so easing off slowly, you usually recommend that rather than going straight to a no oxalate, low oxalate diet, you recommend tapering down for a lot of people. Why is that? Well, because really the work of Susan Owens was she saw when people would do this suddenly and they'd get quite sick. And we, like the woman I mentioned earlier who ended up in the hospital because yeah. she was eating almond bread and then went carnivore abruptly and she got super sick and she's quite in trouble with this inverted T wave and problems. So it, it, a sudden release of oxalate from the tissues will create this loss of potassium and this uh, electrolyte mayhem. So probably replenishing your electrolytes might be the place to start and then coming down slowly enough. Because I think there's some kind of set point that's being set with your daily exposure through the diet. Mm -hmm. And if that set point, if you ease back from the set point, you're less likely to trigger a big expulsion kind of event in the body. It's We don't know because no one studied it. I mean, without Susan Owen saying, hey, this accumulation just starts coming out in these waves and makes you sick, yeah. 
We've actually not studied that in formal research, so we don't have a way to say this is exactly what you should do. We only know from a, a series of many, many individual cases that stuff happens that's really serious. Yeah, I mean, it seems like we know we know a lot of what oxalates do, how they lodge in the body, but we don't know as much about removing them. Right, right. There's a few interesting studies that demonstrate the physiology of it, mm -hmm. um, where the the immune system comes along, and so it's just kind of like an insect bite, you know. If you've, there, you get a mosquito bite, and sometimes that mosquito bite is way more irritating two days afterwards, yeah. and it's a big, it swells up on and off, not consistently, but it'll suddenly bother you for like an hour, and it'll give you a big red welt. Mm -hmm. That's not the mosquito. That's your body's attempt to get rid of the toxin. Yeah, it like pushes fluid in there. You squeeze it, and a little drop of fluid will come out. It'll kind of feel better after you, after that stuff comes out. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. the similar process of going after a toxin and trying to expel it with immune system action that creates heat and itching and pain and mm -hmm. irritation. Well, this is going to happen. It's like getting, having little mosquito bites all in your teeth and your face and your sinuses and your bones and your joints and your muscles and your organs. And the body's got to go clean out all those little toxic things. You mentioned the face earlier as well. Is a face a really – why is it so much accumulation in the face? Is it because there's so much movement in the face throughout the day? So much fluid is getting in and out of it? So much use of the face all day, lots of calcium. This yeah. is a lot of thin bones through the sinus area and the facial bones, the jaw and the teeth, mm. lots of vascularization. So the vascular tissue delivers oxalates coming from your gut to your liver to your heart to your lungs to, straight to your head, right? Yeah. It's, it just doesn't travel that far where the oxalates are passing through a highly calcified area, lots of calcium in the teeth, lots of metabolic activity because you're stressing them all day as we talk and chew and eat and breathe. Yeah. And so the sinus area and the tooth area. So you'll get, eventually, if you're really in trouble with oxalates, you will get some tooth pain that will send you to the dentist. And you'll go, please take out all my teeth. But don't let them do that because your body's doing its microsurgery to get out the toxins and it's going to hurt for a while. Only take out teeth that you've verified or have infections or have a real need. It may just be an inflammatory process of clean, improving the health of the teeth in the long run. Interesting. Do you think gout can have a connection to uh, oxalate at all? Most definitely. Hmm. Has, have there been yeah. studies that uh, that have explored this much? Yeah, there's been a, a couple of opinion papers, very strong one. I can't remember who the author was, but was clearly saying, look, gout is all the crystals. Oxalate's a big part of the gout crystal thing. There are some studies that demonstrate that uric, uric acid follows oxalate. Ah. So it could be that when you find uric acid crystals in the synovial fluid that that was secondary to oxalate having traveled through the fluid and and the urate coming along is a a better alternative to oxalate so uric acid may be less toxic and maybe even beneficial or be an antioxidant kind of response to oxalate having been there and so you may not see the traces of oxalate anymore or you're just not noticing them one of the problems with synovial fluid analyses is that the crystals in the synovial fluid look just like all the other crystals. Hmm. And they don't often do a quality chemical analysis. How do you tell the difference from one calcium crystal from another one? It takes very tricky chemical analysis. You're talking about a dew drop of tissue sample anyway. Mm -hmm. You need enough of the substance to be able to test for it. And I just think it's so impractical sometimes to really differentiate which kind of crystal. And the crystal shapes are so varied and diverse that often they look like each other. So they just assume, based on habit, that these aren't oxalate crystals in the in the joint space when they may, in fact, be. Yeah, very and interesting. And they they are. They I mean they're found. There's many chapters in the rheumatology literature in the textbooks that says oxalate, gout, oxalate crystals in the in the tissues of the joint space, but. They're always assuming that's like a special case. Whether it's more common than that is the only question, and I say it's more common than they've been assuming. Now what about like IBS? A lot of people, you know, they end up doing a elimination diets for stuff like uh, ulcerative colitis, IBS, Crohn's, and they get massive improvements when they use a carnivorous approach. I mean, GAPS is another uh, popular one where you're removing a lot of the possible plant toxins. Um, is there a link between digestion, gut health, inflammatory bowel uh, disorders, inflammatory bowel disease possibly, and um, an oxalate? 
Yeah, there's a big link there that's a sort of cyclical link. It's sort of a catch-22. Mm. If you have a lot of inflammation or damage or dysfunction in the gut, you're going to be a hyper absorber of oxalate, so you're going to absorb a lot more. And, of course, those crystals of oxalate in the food are irritants that are going to exasperate any kind of inflammation. Mm. It's very likely that a high oxalate plus high lectin diet is enough to create... Um, stress in those tissues that you become a sitting duck for any kind of bowel disease, including infectious diseases. So I think the plant toxins, probably the combination of oxalate crystals and lectins are enough to just set us all up for gut problems. And when you quit eating them all in the carnivore diet, you finally give those tissues a rest mm -hmm. and voila. There's also, because the colon excretes oxalate when the system's really high in oxalate and struggling, that constant trafficking and oxalate across those membranes could probably generate colon cancer and other forms of colon cell dysfunction as well. Interesting. Um, what about, all right, so oxalobacter formigenes, I think that's the, uh, the bacteria that people say we're supposed to have, and it should be breaking down these oxalates. A lot of proponents of like vegan diets are saying that, well, if you've got an oxalate problem, which it would, they would claim it would just be a small portion of the population that could have an oxalate problem. I think I would disagree. Uh, if you've got an oxalate problem, it's probably just a lack of this gut bacteria because you've used antibiotics, because you've done these other things in your life. You need to replenish your gut bacteria. You need to fix the gut. Then you don't have to worry about the oxalates. What do you think about this? <laughs> I think it's a fantasy. Uh, fixing the gut is the hardest thing of all to do. And it, it just isn't, it's the gut is a nice short sentence, but it's almost an impossible mission to do. You just take some antibiotics and then you take some yeah. probiotics. Come on. <laughs> yeah, maybe fecal transplant after a year on carnivore or something, and then maybe we can become brand new again. But gut is a big mess right now. So fix the gut. Mm, nice idea. Prove it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds good on paper, right? Yeah, I haven't met anybody who's fixed their gut so much that their oxalate problem went away. It cannot, it, fix the gut can't fix um, mercury overload. It can't fix any other toxic disease. How could it fix the fact that you're loaded with oxalate? The other problem, too, is that absorption of oxalate starts in the mouth and stomach and the upper GI tract. There's very little life in the stomach that would, per, that would eat oxalate. The stomach is nice and acidic. It keeps that oxalate in this kind of sol uh, soluble and absorbable form. So even if you're just getting a little bit in the stomach, that's still oxalate. Plus the crystals of the oxalate in the tish in the food. I mean, how is any gut going to stay healthy if you keep eating eating ground glass? <laughs> that's what it looks like. The stuff when you look at it, the uh, the microscopic pictures, it literally looks like glass. And you can just imagine this. Uh, getting into your gut, you know, going down the digestive tract, it does not look like it's going to be very soothing. Um, you know, whereas like if you pick apart a rare steak, you see it's like, you know, it's soft, it's moist, it's kind of like squishy almost. You know, it just looks like, oh, wow, that's, you know, you could rub that steak between your hands. It feels all good. You take some yeah. of these plants, you take some of this raw spinach, start rubbing that stuff in your hands. You're going to have a sticky, hard film on your hand from these plants, I mean, yeah. especially the more toxic ones. Yeah, yeah, and the, you know the researchers describe the crystals as like diamonds, it's like they're quite gems. They're beautiful. <laughs> well, well-cut diamonds might sparkle under your microscope light, but that doesn't make them good to eat. Well, you use the well-cut diamond to cut stone. Yeah. So if you can cut stone with it, what what can you do to your gut cells? It's only mm. one cell thick, the whole membrane of the gut. That's what's keeping the outside world from your inner world is one layer of cells, and you're gonna throw ground glass and cut diamonds at that and think that's okay day in and day out that's a fantasy that is not rational pretty crazy so you um you know back to the what we can do to uh to relieve ourselves of the symptoms when we're dumping those oxalates mm -hmm. um i've heard you mention dairy before as being useful for some people for binding these things up um what's up with dairy and what place do you think it has in a low oxalate diet well, I think you need to be very aware of what kind of dairy you're eating and not just call all dairy dairy because it's not. It depends a lot on what cows grew it and what they were eating and how mm. processed the dairy food is. So if you're able to get a hold of 
<clears throat> dairy from dairy cows like Guernsey's and Jersey cows that make double A2 um, proteins and get them raw and fresh. They could be incredibly healing. They really make your diet more flexible. If you know how to turn that into cream cheese or you can get good quality cheese from good raw milk and you can tolerate that, that's wonderful because you really do need calcium on this diet. You're depleted. You know, we have most of us who have an oxalate problem have osteopenia. And like for me, my bone density has gone up over 4% after, um, like after I guess that was at like the four year mark on the diet from osteopenia to something better. So uh, I think potassium though helps a lot with bone health. I don't think calcium is the answer to bone health. I think it's really more about protein, potassium, magnesium. And, and there is a significant amount of potassium yeah. that's bioavailable in raw milk in, too. In milk, milk, if whole milk is full of potassium. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah so, I find that raw, raw milk, I do great with it. And, um, and they used to use moral milk as a cure in the in the tuberculosis mm. sanitarium. You'd you'd hang out in the sun and get some vitamin D and drink milk all day for a month and go home well. Yeah. And that's all they. I mean, it was an elimination diet where you were only allowed to eat milk. Wow. Yeah, yeah I think I think it's a really good weight gaining use- food. I think a lot of people coming from vegetarian vegan diets are definitely going to be dumping oxalates. Right. Many yeah. of them also might be underweight. You mentioned osteopenia. Uh, you know, sarcopenia really rampant in the uh, you know, vegan communities. So um, that, I think a carnivorous diet is great. But some of you, if you're trying to gain weight, I think, you know, adding something like raw milk can be a really good. Uh, you mentioned, you know, adding flexibility. It's carbohydrate. So you don't have to deal with adapting to a, keto, a ketotic, ketogenic diet right. while you're doing this. I think raw milk is... Uh, is a really good food. I'm glad. I'm glad that you're uh, a proponent of that. And I wouldn't drink pasteurized milk myself. Um, no, and things like um, commercial cream cheese and stuff that's indigestible. Yeah. That will make you sick. Carignan <laughs> and what are these? Like, what's even in that stuff? Yeah, it's it's. I don't know what they managed to do with it, but even you know, reduced fat milk, they add powdered skim milk to it and all that (laughs) heat processing makes it indigestible and makes it an allergen and makes it a big problem so it's quite different the milk from a cow versus uh milk from the grocery store in fact tomorrow we're going out to see the farmer that makes our raw cream and milk and they've they've called an older cow and they've ground her up for for beef and we're going to go get some beef and meet the cows and hang out with our farmers tomorrow Oh, that's great great you gotta throw some of that up on a some Instagram pictures or something and share that with us. Tag right. me in the raw. I'm, I'm a big fan of raw milk. We get, uh, it's not from Jersey cows, which people swear that Jersey's the best. Uh, we get it from Brown Swiss, which is oh, A2 they're as well. Great. They're a classic yeah. dairy cow. So, you yeah. know, it's just basically the whole scenes are not a classic cow. And yeah. that's, that's the biggest problem in the, they're this. watery. The whole scenes don't have as much cream. It's not as much good fat. Like blue milk. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, the, yeah, milk uh, is milk is a, one of life's pleasures, and if you tolerate it, you know, you've already restricted yourself into sickness. Why not, you know, <laughs> enjoy your your revival? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think. Can. But milk can be a little addictive because it's it's a gain. Really, it's a weight gaining food. It's a powerful food for gaining weight, for gaining muscle, or some fat if you need to. So you be careful, guys. That's why you guys. give it to a baby. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why the bodybuilders, they would do the gallon of milk a day when they're just trying to put on weight. Nothing else is working. They're drinking a gallon of milk a day to put weight on. Um, yeah. It's it's a really powerful weight-gaining food. But what Unfortunately, other, uh, uh, people can't get a hold of good milk anymore. That, that's the hardest part is getting a hold of it. It's not yeah. available to everybody. That's no, criminal that it's you know illegal yeah. in many states. Uh, Australia, I know it's illegal. Um, mm. yeah, much of Canada is very hard to find, so... You know, I mean, uh, some of these places, they're loopholes. Like if you get it for your dogs, you can get raw milk. So, yeah, you know, see if you can. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or if you get your own but goat. You know, there are no rules. Anybody from whatever dietary philosophy you have can lower the amount of oxalate they have. You really don't have to do milk. You don't have to do meat right away unless you just want to stay a little bit sick forever. I think you do need some animal proteins ultimately. But if you're a vegan or vegetarian, you don't have to give that up to still avoid oxalate. This is, there's no one trying to force any idea down your throat. This is just basic information. And if you don't feel good, maybe the toxic oxalate is not good for you. And the, you deserve to know that. We're, yeah. I do not say you must do anything. But please, if you want to be healthy and be in less pain, learn about oxalate. Now, what might a low oxalate vegan diet look like? That's you know even semi, 
you know, I just, I can't imagine one. Maybe you can enlighten us about that because we've had some, uh, I've had some conversations with some, uh, some vegan proponents, some of them really nice, some of them really good people. I disagree with them on the diet. I don't think it's the best diet for human beings. In fact, I think it can be, you know, kind of dangerous. And, uh, but they're, they're talking about doing a low oxalate diet and I haven't seen what they even propose as low oxalate to their clients. Um, what, what might you uh, recommend? What foods could somebody eat that are plant-based that they could build a diet around that don't have a lot of oxalate? Well, um, if your gut can take seeds and beans, then you can use pumpkin seeds in place of your nuts and use sprouted ones. They're sprouted, so you can salt them. You can use them like you would sesame seeds and make your hummus and do that with you can use some chickpeas for your hummus or you can use cauliflower. I have like four different versions of hummus. You can use uh, yellow split peas. But if you're using legumes, you really must soak them, ideally for three days, and then pressure cook them in high heat to kill the lectins. So if you don't do the soaking and the pressure cooking, you've got your phytates and lectins and other plant toxins that are messing with your gut. So if you're willing to do that, they might come out a little mushy, but then you can make some cool things with black eyed peas. I make this really good. Well, I don't make it, but I have this recipe that I used to make for my husband of uh, Persian black eyed peas. It's delicious. It's got a lot of cilantro in there and some onions and a little bit of red, red pepper. Red bell pepper is low in um, oxalate, unlike the green. And if you cook it, you can handle and peel like roasted red peppers. You get rid of the seeds and the peel. That's low in lectins and in oxalate, so that's pretty, and you mix it in, makes a beautiful thing, tastes good. So you can make a lot of salads like that. You can use butternut squash. It's just a little lectiny. You want to make sure you cook it well. Don't do raw. Raw vegan, oh, no. That is not. That is one rule. No such thing as raw vegan. Don't do that. Mm-hmm. you got to be so vegan. That's probably the cook. quickest way to wreck your health with oxalates yeah. is raw vegan. Yeah. Up, mm. Talk about fix your gut. Oh my gosh, mm-hmm. you're a gut train wreck. Raw vegan is guaranteed gut train wreck. Because a lot of people go to raw vegan after doing a normal whole foods vegan diet. When the normal whole foods vegan diet isn't working for them, they're starting to feel worse and worse. They think, mm-hmm. okay, what else is out there? They start hearing about the raw stuff and they think, oh, I'm going to try this out. And they quickly realize, usually, that it's even worse. That they're dying. <laughs> yeah, no, literally they're, dying. No, you yeah. go from. 10 years, 20 years of vegan to raw vegan to try to figure out why you're not awesome and you will be dying. Yeah. I have a couple clients like that and then it's really hard for them emotionally and mentally to realize that they've been wrong all these years and yeah. they're still, they're, it's still their religion, it's still their worldview and it's such a crisis of identity. It's very, very difficult for them. I have, I just want to cry thinking about it because it's so important important to their heart and soul, yeah. the way they've wrapped up their own identity in this. And it's quite difficult. And I'm, um, yeah, no, I've seen the same thing. Hand. I understand how hard this is, but you must learn to get some animal proteins. You cannot, I mean, it's a fantasy to go from vegan to raw vegan back to vegan and think that's going to be good enough. But yeah. if you are vegan and you're still healthy and you're not struggling with anything health wise, then Please cook your vegetables. Cook, cook, cook them. Make sure they're well cooked. You can use high heat on vegetables. It's okay. Um, despite, you know, the sugars that are high cooked, it's other problems. But you yeah. need to cook the lectins out of the squashes and the beans, so on. So yeah. you can, you know, there's salads and you're going to have to live on olive oil. You, you're going to get some fat in there somewhere. And you, you're missing out on the butter. Which, why would anyone want to live without butter? I can't get that around my head because... <laughs> Butter and pig fat are like the center. <laughs> you know, I could do without the pig fat, but you take my butter away and you're going to have problems. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I went without butter for a few weeks, but I found myself drinking a lot more raw milk. You know, I was drinking like at least three <laughs> liters of raw milk a day when my butter was gone because I had no, you know, I had no fat to add. I wasn't able to get really good suet. Um, I like sheep suet. That's a really good one. You ever do that oh, one? Oh, I haven't done that. So good, Sally. Yeah, oh, so um, if you just I'm cut up like – I'm a sheep's cheese fan. Like give me sheep's cheese because I love sheep's fat. Yeah. Yeah, so I love the sheep's suet great. I'm allergic to like goat milk and might be slightly allergic to lamb and I'm like allergic Ooh. to all the poultry. Like when you're oxalate poisoning, poisoned, your immune system is so goofy it thinks it's allergic to food in general. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, so I think uh, when and we talk, and that's something I think repairs over time. But that's immune system calming, and so you need to do everything you can to take care of your immune system. But it takes ten years of 
pushing these oxalates out. So your st- immune system is still struggling with that plus everything else. So if people are dealing with oxalate, maybe they shouldn't be in such a rush to get complete relief. Maybe they've got to realize that you know, the body takes time to heal, it takes time to process these things, and we've got to be in it for the long haul. Right. That's really important. So thank you for making that point. Because we we don't want health information to make anyone sicker. An awful lot of people out there in the health space are putting out information that's garbage and is making people sicker. I am not ever wanting to be part of that club. Yeah, and some, I mean, everybody likes to turn diet into a religion. You know, we've got, YouTube allows anybody to start a cult. So um, you see it in every single type of diet. People wrap up their whole worldview in it. Um, that's what we're always talking about here. We're not trying to start no diet cult. We're trying to give people good information, show people what you can do. And, um, of course, we always bring it back to the importance of animal foods, you know, the importance of easily digestible foods, which the most easily digestible foods come from the animal kingdom. And, um, you know, hey, luckily, if, you, if you're blessed enough to never have to think about these things and you can live the rest of your life eating whatever you want, great. More power to you. But there are a lot of people who struggle. There are a lot of people with various health conditions, various autoimmune conditions, chronic pain, chronic inflammation, uh, you know, joint health, bone health, uh, you know, muscle wasting, and uh, brain fog that could really benefit from looking deeper into this stuff and perhaps even eliminating most plants from their diet. None of us would have considered this in the past. I would have never considered it 10 years ago that I would think that, uh, you know, perhaps I don't need the plants, even though they're delicious, even though they're fun. Uh, I don't need the dang things. So um, I know you've had a recent kind of experience of uh, playing around with a more carnivorous diet after doing a low oxalate diet in various forms for a long time. Um, I'd love to hear about that. How did you, uh, when did you start doing a more carnivore diet? Well, it's the sort of heal the gut path, right? So, you know, we got to heal the gut. And I, that's what got me thinking I, my gut problems were leading to my sleep problems way back when I was discovering oxalate. But as I've been on this low oxalate diet, the, the, the condition that is still bothering me is still some issues with constipation and stuff like that. And so as I get moving, just listening to my body, it's like when, when it's happiest, when my gut is happiest is when I'm not eating plants. And I see this in my clients as well. So for all of last year, basically, I was eating animal foods plus lemon juice, lime juice, coconut products, and just an occasional bits of vegetable here and there, not much. And then um, this year, since I'm so close to full carnivore, I decided in order for me to be an advisor in the nutrition space, I need to do full carnivore and see what that does for my body and learn what that teaches me. I'm just perpetually learning and experimenting and doing that on myself. So I've been pretty much full carnivore for April this year. Um, Without the dairy, luckily we were able to turn off our dairy delivery and not have dairy in the house, except for one, barely an ounce of Gouda once so far in April. And the fun thing about that is that you don't even need to brush your teeth anymore because there's nothing left for the, any bacteria to grow on. Like when you eat cheese or dairy, you're providing um, enough material that this, things can grow on your teeth. But um, yeah, I I really think that a, the elimination di- diet all the way down to animal foods can be very restorative. It's akin to the people in the TV sanitariums being told that they can live only on milk for a month and that heals them. So there's a lot of healing potential in that diet. I am of some metabolic kind of damage from all of this, trying to be healthy all these years. I think that I need help with glycolysis and stuff and probably need a little boost of maybe some white rice twice a month. Or some kind of carbs without the milk, you know. What about just, honey? Do you ever do honey? I do not like honey at all because I'm so allergic. Honey is full of pollen and all these plant chemicals, ultimately, and um, I, it does not agree with me. It's honey is almost pure fructose, so it's like fire for people who are sugar sensitive and get, gets them back into feeming for sugar. So if you want a stable blood sugar and don't want to be craving sugar and don't want allergies, I think honey. I personally. I'm not a fan of honey. I'd rather have a spoonful of maple syrup if I needed a sugar hit and couldn't find anything else in the world. I would take maple syrup over honey. Now, what about white rice versus, uh, you know, or, or white bread versus whole grains? Like, what do you? Oh. I, this is a little bit of an ancillary question. Um, yeah. But 
Yeah, what, you have to talk about weed at all. I mean, weed is such a problem for so many of us. The oxalate world, if you got an oxalate problem, you probably have a gluten problem. Mm -hmm. um, and weed is probably not your friend, but I think white rice is superior to brown rice. Yeah. Because of oxalates, because of the fibers that can be irritating to the gut. And we certainly see that all of Asia chose to refine their rice to white rice for a reason. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And it's much lower in oxalate. I mean, there's only a couple of varieties of rice. I think it's jasmine rice and one other that test pretty low in oxalate. So you can maintain like a vegetarian low oxalate diet and use white rice products and jasmine white rice and things like that. Cool. But cool. I, I don't think bread is, you know. Yeah, I don't think I it's think great. But I, people. I think that white bread, bread might be thing. better than the whole wheat bread. That's just yeah, what kind of totally. what I was getting at there. Yeah, yeah. Well, for sure. Go for like Wonder Bread if you have to. It's <laughs> much better than that seeded whole grain, marvelous brown brick. Ezekiel oh. bricks. <laughs> I though did used to love the fermented rye bread, the German. I forget okay. with pumpernickel, the old school pumpernickel. I used to think that was awesome, but. Mm hmm. You know, live and learn. Yeah. So mostly carnivore. Every once in a while, a little bit of carbohydrate, maybe some white rice. That might be the uh, the, the best way for you to do it right now. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. But, you know, everybody is where they are. You have to be where you are and figure out what your next move is and pivot in a gentle, compassionate way and get the support you need. And, and don't try to do it all by yourself, especially with oxalates. I mean, everyone will look at you like you're green Martian if you say the word oxalate out in public or at a party or at your mom's house. You know, nobody's heard of oxalate. Right. Right. So we have this online way to connect now, which is really cool. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. No, I found that the, uh, the carnivore approach definitely works. I mean, you know, after helping people with, you know, fad loss, body composition change and stuff with keto, um, getting to learn a little bit more about all these plant toxins in the last few years has just been fascinating. And I find that the more I apply a carnivorous approach from coaching people, especially when they're dealing with autoimmune stuff, the, the results are ridiculous. Like you, it almost, some of the stories, some of these remission type stories you get from people almost sound like they're made up because they're so, it's almost miraculous with a lot of these people. So I think the oxalates are definitely a major issue that so many of us are just missing, have never heard of it, or maybe we've heard a little bit about it, but then gotten lulled back to sleep by the, uh, you know, the kind of apologist for the vegetables. But I think, uh, yes. yeah, I, right. I think we're going to see a lot of people moving away from recommending so many cups of fruits and vegetables per day as this, you know, health panacea. Um, I hope you're right. There's so many pe big names coming out with books still pushing vegetables, and it's really yeah. sad. It's not scientific. It's fashion. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's hard for them to see beyond it because, of course, they've got you know they've got their uh, the science with a line down the s. Uh, telling them that you know mostly fruits and vegetables are so healthy, it's so great, yeah. it's so amazing, it's so enlightening, it's going to save the world, it's going to save your health, it's going to save the animals, and uh, unfortunately, none of those end up panning out in the real world. So I uh, I really hope that uh, that more people start to gravitate towards this. I mean, that's why and I know you got a copy of the book now too, but that's why we did no no plants at all in the carnivore cookbook. Yay. So I, I don't know if there's another book out there that's like absolutely no. plantless. Um, it's, it's amazing work of art. It's really good. Thanks. Thanks. We really appreciate it. We, uh, there's a little bit of dairy in there and there's one recipe yeah. that used a little bit of honey. I know Sally would prefer if we used maybe maple in there, but we're in Ecuador. We can't get the dang yeah, you maple. Can't get maple. <laughs> <laughs> I love maple yeah. syrup though. Maple syrup is amazing. Um, and you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't push people away from that if they want to include carbohydrates in their diet in a reasonable amount. But yeah, so with the carnivore cookbook, zero carb recipes, you guys, if you're interested in, you know, a book for... Uh, a low oxalate diet that'll show you how to prepare animal-based foods. This is all zero oxalate recipes, um, and we did our best to uh, to make it as easy, simple, and straightforward as possible. So we show you how to use the whole animal in there, and you know um, we're just we're really happy to have a book that is that's so unique and that's so comprehensive. And Jessica did a really good job. So shout out to Jessica for the Carnivore Cookbook. There's a link down in the description. I'm happy to have one in Sally Norton's hands. Honored to have her stamp of approval on it. And um, yeah, so I think we've we've hit on a lot here today. We've given people a lot to think about. Um, I know you are full of anecdotes as well with all the clients that you've worked with and helped with low oxalate approach and helped to get rid of this stuff. Um, 
But I, I let's start wrapping it up. I don't want to waste any more of your time here or take any more of your time here, Sally Norton. Well, let me just throw out that I think we need to learn together. I, I really don't know what the right or the best advice is for when to for people who want to move all the way to carnivore, when to time that in terms of the oxalate piece. It's not at the beginning, I can tell you that. And when are we when at what point are we ready to move all the way down to the zero uh, oxalate diet and then to the full carnivore diet so that you can separate out the effects of the different elements. Mm. It's really, um, the beautiful thing about my journey is I was able to separate out. I've done everything. I, this is how I understood how much oxalates were going on because of the way I just sort of tried things one at a time over the decades. And same thing. I didn't get to carnivore till over five and a half years of full, low, almost no oxalate eating. So I, to, as a community, for those of you who are moving towards carnivore and are aware of the oxalates or those of you who are advising people to do so, when's the time? What is our, what protocol can we develop as a community for when's the time to switch over and do it safely? We want everyone's health to be improved, not to make this process harder on their biology and their lives. It's a great question. Yeah, that's something I'm always thinking about too, you know, and uh, I mean, I've... I mean, you probably dealt with a lot more people with intense oxalate sensitivity and really intense oxalate toxicity. So, you know, I mean, I've, as far as trans, uh, transferring from a ketogenic diet to carnivore or even a standard American diet to carnivore, I've yet to see any adverse reactions. Uh, you mentioned one earlier that was pretty alarming. That woman who was eating loads of almond flour all the time, switched over to carnivore, was so low. And you, you mentioned potassium was so low um, and she was so depleted. Um, you know, so you know, people do have to be careful. So I think, I think the so advice. They, they okay. get the, the negative stories are out there. The Triangle Oxalate Group, which is led by Susan Owens, has uh, several people who say they've landed in the emergency room doing this. Um, and we've seen, you know, a, an uptick of people going carnivore that are showing up in the, oh, my God, what's happened to me mode. So there definitely some people are depleted enough that it's quite metabolically traumatic and you're in the emergency room and there's not a single healthcare professional who knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's really crazy how few doctors, how few of these people giving nutritional information, um, know anything about oxalates, uh, especially, you know, you don't see anybody talking about this really very few people, uh, who seem to understand this in, you know, like the vegan community. So, uh, hey, but uh, shout out to, uh, to Simon Goji Man. I know he's looking deeper into this, and he's uh, definitely considered the toxicity of oxalates in the diet. I, uh, you know, I might not agree with his approach, but I appreciate him being honest with his audience and, uh, you know, look forward to him being open and honest with his audience in the future, too, about this stuff. So uh, this is something that all us, all us dietary communities, all us crazies out there trying to get our health back using uh, using diet need to consider. And, um, I think I got to tell you, I really appreciate your advice on the citrate minerals, you know, the calcium citrate, magnesium citrate, and potassium citrate. That is something that I have been using, uh, to help people transitioning into carnivore and into, you know, a lower oxalate diet. Some people who do it, they don't even know. Some people come to you, they've already been doing carnivore and they have no idea about oxalates anyways. They've just, they've seen other people doing well with it and they decide to switch to it. So I think it can be very helpful to look into the use of those citrate minerals. Um, you know, I'm not huge on uh, supplements. I'm not selling any supplements, but they can definitely be helpful for balancing out the body when you're, uh, when you're transitioning and you might have those uh, those electrolyte imbalances and something well, that I've noticed, Sally. Just one mm -hmm. more thing. What I've noticed is people tend to have electrolyte imbalances more on straight keto than they do on carnivore, yes. right? Yes. So oh, and that's sure. on. <laughs> so that's what's fascinating me. A yeah, lot of well, carnivores don't need it at all. Straight keto is too high in oxalate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But keep in mind that this getting rid of the oxalates that you used to eat is a ten year process. Mm. And you could be carnivore for two years before you start getting back pain, arthritis, hip pain, tooth pain, whatever. These symptoms of your body going after all the toxins in your body, the deeper healing may take a couple of years. Because yeah. if your kidneys aren't healthy or, you know, who knows, but your system, when it's finally ready, will get into some periods of some issues for a lot of us. And so you may not even realize like nine months later, oh my gosh, I'm my hips are killing me. What's happening? The carnivore is not working. It may not be that the carnivore is not working. It's that it is working and your body is healing. And I, here I am, 
five and a half something years on low oxalate. And today I know as of yesterday, my hips are aching again. I've got issues. I can tell I'm going through hip cleaning right now. So, but if you don't realize that you may think, well, it doesn't matter if I'm all carnivore, it's not working. It is working. So the healing, there's sort of the pain of the healing and it might show up years later. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And I've seen this with people six, eight months down the line where their digestion is great. Then it goes off for a few weeks and it gets really yep. intense and then they go back and they feel fine. Yeah, and that's often the gallbladder. That's often the stones and junk in the gallbladder healing, and the gallbladder stops working in terms of producing what it would normally produce because it's healing the oxalate and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You almost always see uh, the digestive system starts shutting down a little bit when it's doing construction work. You know, when you mm -hmm. fix a road or a bridge, the capacity for that road or bridge to keep carrying traffic and doing what it does every day goes down. So you'll see those times when the digestive system looks like it's in trouble, but it may be just offline because it's fixing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well said. So yeah, guys, um, you know, there's a lot more to the picture than some of us might have realized. Maybe the vegetables, the spinach, the nuts, the seeds are not our best friend. And uh, there might be something to these elimination diets that bring you on a mostly or all animal food diet uh, that's just beyond just the removal of fiber. You know, a lot of people are talking about fiber being perhaps, you know, unnecessary, but it might go beyond that. There's probably some, uh, some other factors going on that you haven't considered, and oxalate is something to look into. So, um, Sally K. Norton, where can everybody find your work? Where can they find your stuff? And uh, it, actually, let me, let me read these super chats first. Uh, Israel de Leon says, how much potassium citrate should one take? I made sure we hit on that earlier, Israel. I'm sure, I'm sure you heard. But um, uh, Sally, do you want to reiterate dosage for potassium citrate? Yeah, we'll start everything small. So if you haven't been taking it, start low. Start really low, like 400 milligrams a day, and build up to at least half the RDA, which is the RDA is 4,700 milligrams. So, you know, go up to like two and a half grams. But do all of that gradually, and then take more when you don't feel good. There you go. There you go. Start slow and increase as needed. Um, the Corinam C, sorry, I ruined your name. Um, for $2, thanks for the donation, man. He says, uh, where can we find a complete list of oxalates? So I guess he's looking for a list of high oxalate foods to avoid. Do you have one on your website? Yeah, I have the beginner's guide that is the basic list. It's a good way to start. I have a much more intense document that I have available for clients. There is a um, spreadsheet that you can ask for from the Trying Low Oxalate group that has the data that the Volvo Pain Foundation put together and some data that they funded at the Trying Low Oxalate group. Um, there, that spreadsheet is good enough. It's got a few um, issues on there, that a few mistakes, but... That's the best data we've got. It's better than several of the university lists that are out there. So, and then I have my own version that's color coded and reorganized and vetted and cleaned out. Um, but I don't just give it away for political reasons, basically. Okay. Um, yeah. So, ZKY2 for five euros, I think that is, says vegan one and a half years. Lost sex drive, lost muscle mass, digestion got worse. Tried going keto carnivore recently, but felt super dizzy and weak. Tips? Well, um, I, Sally, uh, sounds like we've got a case of perhaps uh, that could be helped from some of the citrate minerals, huh? Or yep. slower removal of oxalate, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. So if you need to, if you are having a sense that you're spewing oxalates from your tissue, then maybe a cup of tea and a piece of chocolate might. There's some belief on the trying low oxalate group that you can reset like get the body to realize oh no we're back in the blackberry patch now stop trying to expel oxalate so and some people find it that helps them to cut the symptoms to add back something with oxalate like tea and chocolate there you go so a little bit of chocolate might help slow it down and check out the uh the citrate minerals for electrolyte balance and that's all the super chats um what is your website called sally sallyknorton.com SallyKNorton.com. SallyKNorton.com, yep. All right. What, anything else exciting coming up? Any news? Any big well, announcements? there's been a lot of interviews. So if you like sitting around and listening to me talk, <laughs> you can spend an entire weekend. <laughs> nothing but, And I've actually heard people are doing that. So there's more podcasts coming out. Um, 
I'll be showing up at a few conferences, but basically I'm going to try to make myself get more of my book written this year and nice. try to get that in the hands of a publisher. I haven't yet found a publisher. So that's the job I need to focus on. Awesome. Congratulations. I look forward to getting my hands on your book when it's finally ready. And uh, Sally K. Norton, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. And to the audience, thanks for hanging out. You can find more at sallyknorton.com. And uh, you can find more at primaledgehealth.com. So uh, more streams to come, more content to come. I've been doing a lot of these interviews, a lot of these streams. And uh, I, might, I might slow down the frequency, though, so I can do other normal videos, shorter format and whatnot. But I love talking to these experts. I love uh, being able to share this information with you guys. And uh, I know the longer format videos don't get as many views. I know people on YouTube want, you know, TMZ nutrition and all this nonsense, um, silly content. But... Uh, but we're here to, uh, to really push the envelope and really share valuable information with you guys. So thanks so much for hanging out, guys. Thanks to everybody in the chat. Thank you for supporting. And check out the, uh, the Carnivore Cookbook, Zero Carb Recipes for people who really love animals on PrimalEdgeHealth.com. There's a link in the description below. Um, all animal foods, zero carb recipes for the most part, zero oxalate recipes, pretty much the ultimate elimination diet cookbook. And we're super happy to have it out. So Jessica... Shout out to Jessica Haggard, my lovely wife, and um, check out the book in the link in the description. See you guys next time.